Welcome back to the Biconics Review of Honor, or BRO. I'm JVL, and today I'm here alone. I'm going to go through Ring of Honor for July 6th, 2023, and give you what happened, what we think, and how it could be a little better. But first off, as per usual, even though I don't have my co-host here, I'm extending to you the code of honor. All right, let's get into the matches. First on the card, Gringo Loco versus Commander. This is what we've been waiting for, folks. I am a fan of Gringo Loco. He is the big man that can move like a cat that I identify with. I don't know why. But he has been on a tour of ROH lately, and he has found a great niche in that promotion where he has brought his power game along with the Lucha Libre style. He is literally a flying groundhog. He has that squirrel-like tendency, the flying squirrel. He bounces around, but he's got the weight class to take out the rest of the Lucha Animal Kingdom. Tonight, his match with Commander was basically a clinic on Chris Jericho's most famous move, the arm drag. There were low drags. There were high drags. It looked like these two men were pulling arms from different multiversal variants and dragging them right into the thing. Too many drags for anyone, and I love a good drag show. However... We also had an amazing thing that warmed my heart, which was I heard the ref on the mics from that match talk about if each of the wrestlers was okay, but in their native language. Having bilingual or trilingual refs in your company makes it so much better as a a thing to have that there. I can't stress enough how awesome the staff at ROH is. But they keep it refreshing. They keep it creamy. They keep it smooth. I think I might be a little hungry on this one. But either way, they kept it really, really tight. And... You know, I might be a bit biased here. I wish Gringo Loco could have gotten the win, but he ended up losing to Commander off a 450 splash. Go back and watch this. Flippy tippy stuff with a bit of power. Honestly, really good match. Then we have Lee Moriarty and Big Bill talking to Lexi about their upcoming match tonight against Dalton Castle's The Boys. Now, Lee Moriarty, very excitable, talks very fast, really gets too much, and Bill stops him. And I get to hear Big Bill on the mic for the first time in four years and he's got a blow pop in his mouth. So it's clacking around, moving around, and I just wanted to vomit. I couldn't deal with the fact that it was just so bad. Somebody take the blow pop out of his mouth and let him speak, because my five-year-old can enunciate better with yogurt in her mouth than Big Bill can with a giant piece of candy. Not worthwhile, didn't need to be there. Let's move on. Next, we get one of my favorite matches of the night. Christopher Daniels versus Daniel Garcia. The old guard versus the conflicted guard. Can either of these two have a bad match? No. The the answer is definitely no. And what grabbed my attention here was Daniel Garcia is visibly fighting himself to continue swinging his hips, being that sports entertainer, when all he wants to do is take advantage of his opponent on the ground, beaten to a pulp, and break them. Ugh. Uh, it's getting to the point where I need to see him make a choice. And I think that's coming based on other things in AEW. But honestly... Garcia is selling amazingly. He is not bad at anything. He is so smooth, so easy in the ring. So, a very good TV match. Garcia wins with a double arm DDT. And then, my moment of the night. He grabs Aubrey Edwards as she's raising his hand, spins her around like Fandango used to do, and then just gets up grinding at her. Aubrey's having none of it, jumps out of the ring, giving him the stink eye, and he continues to do it. Daniel Garcia, mwah. Up next, Willie Mack is backstage with Lexi, and they're talking about the upcoming six-man mayhem match for $25,000. He's talking about how he's never had that amount of money. He could do so many things with it. Go and buy a bunch of things he's needed. Take a trip to Jamaica to get some real jerk chicken. And he honestly, surreptitiously, slides in a big date request to Lexi, asking her if she'd go out with him. And she accepted, barring he gets the twenty-five k. So, Willie Mack, I'm rooting for you. Let's see if he can get through that. Up next... Gates of Agony versus Action Andretti and Darius Martin. These two teams, whether it's in three-man matches, uh, trios, uh, complete uh, triple threats, everything else, they are going against each other. This is the big tag team story. Now, I have to ask, do you enjoy a monster man meet beating up agile flippy dudes? Because this is your match. This is literally your match. Uh, it's just so much more. These teams spent the entirety of the match subverting that usual trope of big man, little man, everything gets beat together, and they took it to almost a weird, gritty, and yet also goofy extreme. Uh, This is exemplified by Andretti's in the ring, 
He's got both Koa and Khan from the Gates of Agony up there against him. He ducks a chop from Koa, chops him in the uh, chest. Ducks a chop from Khan, who also chops Koa in the chest, chops Khan. There's a chop off, everything else. Andretti jumps back to try to hit them. They catch and slam Andretti. So really good interchange there. One scary spot in the match, though. We did see uh, Andretti going for a dive to the outside. Koa tried to catch him, but tripped and fell and went right over face first into the barricade. Worried about him there. Hopefully something comes from it. But overall, really good that good match match together. I need to see more of this pairing. This could be a tag team title feud. Up next, our first of, as I'm calling for Canada and using the professor on his thing here, squatch matches. Because they're not squashes. We're in Canada. It's a squatch match. Stu Grayson and the Righteous versus Zach Patterson, McRae Martin, and Rip Impact. Jobber entrance, they mention offhand that the three jobbers are students of Stu Grayson, but this match didn't even get started. Three moves, they were done, trying to prove the dominance of the Righteous and Stu Grayson, but honestly all it did was show that they don't trust them enough to carry a match, they cannot work together in tandem, and it was so quick, Vincent didn't even take off his coat. These are three disparate singles wrestlers stuck together as a group, and it's not working, and they're trying to bring the Dark Order down to their level, but there's no heat. Honestly, ROH, it's time to pull the plug. Get rid of this right now. I'm done. Up next, the aforementioned match, Big Bill and Lee Moriarty versus Dalton Castle's boys, who did not get named at this entire match. That tells you how it goes. This is basically another squash match. Bang, bang, right there. Lee Moriarty, though, this man can fly. This man can break. This man can run the ring like no one else. Big Bill, he's big. You can't teach that. But honestly, what else are you going to teach him? Because all he can do are big man power moves and step over the ring ropes. That's all he did here. He had a giant choke slam from one side of the apron. He carried one of the boys all over the other and slammed him on the other apron, which, funnily enough, you heard on the ring mics, one of the fans yell out, that's the hardest part of the ring. So thank you, Simon Miller. It's catching on. Then we had the other spot that was here where Big Bill goes to big boot one of the boys. The other boy jumps on his shoulders as if they were two toddlers in a trench coat. And commentary makes the reference that this is a Muppet Babies move. Now, I've watched Muppet Babies. I love Muppet Babies. I don't know where they're pulling from or where that came from, but I think Caprice was a little bit off with it. And honestly, Caprice, I love you for trying. But this was a quick succession match. Big Bill and Moriarty win and no storyline or heat is built with it. It's literally just to showcase that they're there. That's kind of how I'm feeling ROH has been right now, which is sad because Death Before Dishonor is coming up, but a lot of people are just there. All right, you thought we were done with the Squatch matches. No, this is Edmonton. We found where Squatch lives. We're going to his lair because up next was Athena versus Silesia Sparks. Now, Silesia is not your usual jobber. She is an ROH original who's been stuck in Canada since the pandemic came up with Athena, they have a background, but honestly, this was no offense from Sparks. Athena just hitting a couple moves, and the match ends on a stiff jaw shot from Athena to Sparks, knocking her out, pinning her, taking it over. Basically, this was for Athena to walk in with her shirt on, saying, tonight's jobber is your mom, and then to beat up a jobber. Didn't set up any contenders for her title at ROH Death Before Dishonor, didn't do anything to add to her character. She did do the after beat up that a heel does and DDT'd Sparks onto the title, but no one came out for the save. No one did anything else. Athena, what are we doing here? You need someone to fight you. And I'm hoping someone that shows up later might be that person going forward. Okay, let's take a breath. Let's get a little bit of juice, a little bit of water, do some post-workout stuff here because we're out of the squatch matches. We're into, oh God, Tony Nese. Um... Yes, this was Tony Nese versus J.D. Drake set up. Uh, starts off like every other Tony Nese thing where he starts a promo going off on the fitness of his opponent, going after Canadian food and how bad it is, poutine and stuff like that, and saying J.D. Drake's obviously been partaking. So heal Tony Nese. Great. So J.D. Drake is playing the babyface, right? No. J.D. Drake is a bigger heel. He goes off and says he would never put that Canadian trash in his stomach and waste his calories that way. He wants Dunkin' Donuts and Freedom Fries only. This is how you know J.D. Drake is a true heel. He keeps the word donuts in Dunkin' Donuts, and he knows that corporate got rid of that at least a year ago. So J.D. Drake, the bakery industry is watching you. But, lo and behold, we know we can't have two heels fight. They're not going to fight each other. 
Mark Briscoe appears, as he is apt to do. He comes out of the wild and just shows up and says, I've talked to Tony Khan, I'm in this match. So the match happens. It's a lot of the usual with the heels not being able to work together, Mark Briscoe taking advantage of it, and he ends up winning with a giant splash. This match, in general, was a mediocre match that was let down by an especially mediocre promo. I feel like it could have gone shorter. I feel like it didn't need Mark Briscoe. It should have probably just happened quickly, or it should have been a breakdown from the initial promo. So not worth your time. We then cut to a pre-recorded promo, again, talking to Eddie Kingston, who has won the NJPW Strong. Uh, I think it's their title there for that on NJPW Strong. And he talks directly to, lo and behold, Mark Briscoe. And he says, I can't be there to take on Claudio for his ROH title. I'm now in the G1. But Mark, it's your time. Do your brother proud. Do us all proud. I believe in you. It's Mark Briscoe's time. No transition whatsoever. Right to Mark with Lexi. And Mark is like, yes, I deserve that. I love my brother. I need to show the world. It is my time. And Claudio Castagnoli walks in to interrupt him. And this is where everything went off the rails. Surprising, I know. Claudio gets up into Mark's face right here and begins to forget everything that he was trying to learn right off camera. And I love Claudio. He is a wonderful wrestler. His personality is beautiful and funny and ridiculous, and he gets to showcase none of that. He talks in circles for two and a half minutes about how Mark needs to back away because he showed Eddie Kingston that he wasn't right about himself being intense, and Mark Briscoe isn't good enough for this, and so he has to show him that, and he has to show him this, and he continues to talk and forget where he is and tries to cut off his thing, and it doesn't work. This promo had so many false endings, it felt like I was in Return of the King. You know, it's when you talk so much and then you remember you're supposed to be able to say something to somebody and... Oh, oh, and you... And then you call out Eddie Kingston because you remember you have to do that. So you have to get that one last thing in there. Up next, Diamante versus Vanessa Craven. This was supposed to be a squash match it was supposed to be set up as one and diamante didn't let it happen she is slowly becoming one of the my favorite stars to watch on roh tv not only because she represents the second or shock third women's match on the card each night tony khan get that on dynamite but it's also because she's a gritty brawler she is no nonsense and she takes it everyone she's getting that tweener tug which is amazing and she holds her own against people even twice her size which Tonight happened. Vanessa Craven, six foot, six foot one, Diamante, five three at best. But she took that big versus little match and kept her solidness, her grittiness. And instead of flying around using her agility to back things down, Diamante beat the crap out of Craven. And yes, didn't get every mat in, every bit in there. The monster still took her around, but she didn't give up, and she used power and smarts to do it. Uh, it's so heartening to see a badass member of the LGBTQIA community be featured on TV, let alone keep winning. She is racking them up. I want the tweener turn, and I need Diamante to be Athena's next match. She could even win. So Diamante, right there with you. Then we had the six-man mayhem match for $25,000. Everyone loves a good little bit amount of money. And 25K ain't bad, so thank you, Tony Khan, for throwing that there. Your participants tonight, Shane Taylor, who has been working with the Workhorseman, Josh Woods, Brian Cage of the Mogul Embassy, our favorite, Willie Mack, who could win a date with Lexi, Dalton Castle and his army of local boys, because obviously everybody from the Edmonton wrestling scene came out for this, and the return of one of my favorite underrated wrestlers, Trent Seven. Now, I am sad Mustache Mountain won't get back together because they're in disparate companies, but oh, is it good to see Trent Seven back again. He is hard-hitting and fun. This match was insane goodness. This started with Dalton Castle and his army of boys coming to the ring, talking about what they were going to buy. A lot about potted plants on sale, which was great, and then his flourish. But there was also a problem with this match. We had the great entrances. We had the great things put together, amazing people. And then it fell into the trap that every multi-man match does, which is get everyone else out of the ring. We need to have a singles match and then we'll switch that singles match up and then we'll move it over here. And I worried that it would fall into that trap just to continuously do that for the rest of the match until the participants realized as hard hitting as they all are, they're all hilarious storytellers. And this is when you lean into that goofy wrestling. Here's my examples. Here's what you need to see. Go back and watch this match for Dalton Castle. Every time he got in the ring, he was immediately ejected. Every side, four different times. 
He gets in for the fifth. Shane Taylor's in there with him, and he gets Josh Woods out, turns to Shane Taylor. So Dalton Castle has finally broken the streak, and Shane Taylor manhandles the crap out of him, sending him in a giant backward stage dive into his boys. That's Dalton Castle's night. Then, right off the bat after that, Willie Mack comes in and starts the stiffest and also most entertaining stunner party that I have seen since Raw vs. Raw. A Raw after Raw. And honestly, everyone in this match sold it perfectly. Sold it so over the top, it would make The Rock blush. And you know, Stone don't blush. We come here, we go there. Trent Seven, specifically, on his cell of the stunner, stopped in midair and somehow stopped time before falling flat. It was ridiculous. Go back and watch this. Finally, Brian Cage comes in for his stunner, and Willie Mack is on a roll, and he blocks it, gets the roll-up with the tights, and wins the 25K. Brian Cage, who doesn't need a win, gets the 25K, but ROH did something smart. They sold that Prince Nana was thinking, like Christian Cage, that he is the one that won this money, so I'm thinking this bit of money is going to start to crack the Mogul Embassy. Let's hope it does, because they need something to give them a little bit of momentum other than swerve. So, good on you. Watch the match if you want some goofy wrestling, but it is a little longer than it needed to be. All right, we are at our final match of the night. The Infantry and Trisha Dora versus The Kingdom and Maria Canellis bennett Oh, how I love to watch Maria wrestle. If you go back to old ROH, she is an outstanding wrestler. So, seeing her come out in her gear, she's ready to go. She's saying, you all want to see me wrestle? Yes, we do. Well, you're not. Because it's been five years and she is not medically cleared to wrestle. This woman has given birth to two children and been through three companies in five years. She's not ready. So who are they going to bring in? Who could it be? They, they said they mentioned Shooter last week. Shooter. She's legit, isn't she? Oh, yes, she is. Out comes legit Layla Hirsch. And this, my friends, was her coming back party. Legit, she had been out with an ACL tear. She had been sidelined for a bit after her big Chris Statlander matches. And she was here to take back her spot. And her partners didn't let her for the most part. So this is where the match went. The infantry didn't prepare for her. Trisha Dora wasn't prepared for her. And she tried from minute one to be in that ring and showcase herself. And the kingdom kept tagging themselves in. And with multi-gen- uh, multi-gender rules, you can't have man versus woman. It's just what it is. So we have Mike Bennett selling. We've got Matt Taven selling. And it's really the heels getting a lot of uh, time beaten up, but also helping out. Legit Layla Hirsch trying to get in multiple times. She is going under the ropes. She's going over the ropes. She's trying to get in the ropes. And her own partners are stopping her. So finally, by the end of it, we have a couple dives to the outside and she just gets in. Rex House knocks people out and makes Trisha Dora tap out in the arm bar. She breaks everyone's spirit and I'm so here for it. And while they're celebrating in the ring from the wonderful kingdom winning, she gets out and is looking back like you're next. You're done. So thank you. Welcome back, Layla Hirsch. Quick match, easy to take down, and I'm glad she's there. I wish they had ended there because I could give my review at that point. But no, we cut to a Layla Hirsch promo. Now, for all that I've said, Layla Hirsch is amazing. She is a dominant physical entity. Her mic skills have never been that great, and she's just back from injury. I'm surprised they stuck her in this position where she had to sell herself and remind everyone who she is. Get this woman a mouthpiece. Get get her someone that can really sell her out and show what she can do so that she can focus on being a killer in the ring. Because once you do that, she's unstoppable. But this was a letdown on a really good show and knocked it down to me. So we get that cut to black. That is your Ring of Honor Fight TV broadcast for the night. Now, overall for me. Solid B- to C- plus show. Work was good, work was great. While I enjoy hunting for Squatch, too many Squatch matches, and Big Bill, take that stupid thing out of your mouth. You are so much better than that. But I'm also worried because this didn't further anything for Death Before Dishonor, and that's coming up pretty fast. We don't have time to lollygag. We don't have time to sit around. Tony Khan, you need to build some stuff in here now. If you like ROH, you understand ROH, watch this show. If you can catch the replay with a couple of highlights, probably do that if you're not into ROH yet because it'll get rid of the middling part. I've enjoyed it, but that's just me. I'm too far gone in this to say I wouldn't enjoy an ROH night. So that is my review. That is my Biconics review of honor, the bro. Let us end the code of honor. I've been JBL. Check out Biconics Wrestling Pod 
on all the different socials at BC WrestlePod. Check out all the rest of us and your hosts if you like us. Check out the other reviews we've got up on the channel right now, including my long-form AEW Dynamite review with The Professor, which we try to beat the clock in five minutes and keep it to a tight 13. And you know what? You've been amazing, and I'll see you next week in the ring.